I'm joined by Representative Mike Gallagher on the House Armed Services Committee on the House Intel Committee as well. Good morning, Congressman. Welcome. Normally, we, we have a little fun about football, but this is it's not a time for fun. Uh, Putin is just an evil tyrant like Assad, like Xi, and we are buying his oil. Why are we doing that? Well, it's even worse, Hugh. Not only are we buying his oil, but all of these sanctions that were announced, for example, sanctions on the Russian central bank. My understanding is there is a big fat loophole, the size big enough that you could drive a Russian tank through that still allows them to process payments for oil, for yes. energy. There's just a massive misunderstanding about the level of sanctions we put on the regime. And the fact is, Russia's economy is so dependent on energy. That's how energy, that's how money gets into the country, that unless you sanction the energy industry, then you're not actually having the massive effect on Russia that the Biden administration is telling us they're having right now. I don't understand it. I don't understand also why there's not a crash program to unleash the true power of American energy in order to help our European allies. Now, that's not something you can do overnight. It's going to be the work of a few years. You need regasification facilities in Europe if we're going to continue to ship LNG. Uh, but we have that natural resource. We have the in innovation and ingenuity. What we need is better policy both here and for my European allies to make that possible. And over the next five years, I think it's possible we could wean Europe entirely off Russian gas. And that would be a massive geopolitical win for us for them and a massive geopolitical loss for Putin. But this administration, I, I fear Hugh, just remains captive to the climate left. That's what it is. When you dig underneath all of it, it, it is this, that, the, the, the almost religious climate change evangelist movement that brooks no dissent, whose chief priest is John Kerry, who has a special role in this administration you know, with 100 staffers in Foggy Bottom working out of George Marshall's old office. Tell me how that makes sense. It does not at all, and it's doing serious damage to our geopolitical position right now. Let me play for you an exchange between Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, appeaser in chief. She negotiated the 1994 appeasement of North Korea. She neg negotiated the 2007 appeasement of Iran. Her people are in charge of the unfolding appeasement of Iran, a second time being accomplished through Russian agents in Vienna. And she was before the House subcommittee with Brian Mast yesterday, and she said this in exchange to his question, in response to his question, cut 14. Uh, should Europe and the West divest, Western Europe uh, and the Western world divest of Russian energy, in your opinion? You know, I think that there is a lot of rethink, and there will be, about energy security worldwide. I think you have... Okay, to stop right there. Uh, Mike Gallagher, this is Aspen Institute nonsense. I first met Wendy Sherman at the Aspen Institute in my one time there. I'm never going back. It's just a left wing wake for the JCPOA, and it's gone completely off the rails, like a lot of cable, like a lot of Beltway news. And they are in the grip of this climate absolutism, but it doesn't make any sense. They want a carbon tax. They want to raise the cost of oil and gas. If we sanction Russian oil and gas, it will do that. So I don't understand why they are opposed to it, except they are opposed to the use of Western power on anything. Because the climate evangelists have done something very clever in the last two decades. They've sort of wrapped themselves in all this rhetoric about climate change and the need to save the world from imminent extinction while advocating policies that hurt Americans. And yet all they do is outsource their emissions to countries like Russia and China. The same is true of the climate left in Europe. The, the same is true of all the ESG evangelists on Wall Street. They just advocate for policies where they don't have to see the environmental consequences of their actions. They're just giving a massive economic gift to countries like Russia and China, who I guarantee you, Hugh, don't give a lick about the environment. The other thing about Wendy Sherman is, I mean, that was an easy no, by the way. Just say, no, we don't, we don't want to be dependent on Russian oil and gas. The, I'm glad you mentioned the Iran angle, Hugh. I don't think most Americans still understand that at the same time we are trying to deal with Vladimir Putin in Ukraine and patting ourselves on the back because the Ukrainians are bravely fighting to the death despite American, uh, a robust American support. We are reliant on the Russians 
in Vienna to negotiate the revival of the JCPOA. Actually, we shouldn't even call it uh, the JCPOA because this deal will actually be worse than the JCPOA, the 2015 Iran deal. And I would invite your listeners to think about this uh, in a few ways. One, it will be a massive gift to Russia. Russia wants to sell uranium and weapons to Iran. Russia is fine with Iran having a dominant role in the Middle East, threatening our allies, be they the Sunni Arab Gulf states or Israel. So point one, if we revive the Iran deal, we will be giving Russia a massive gift. Point two, as I mentioned before, compared to the 2015 deal, this will be much, much worse. Like I guarantee you they're going to propose removing sanctions on Iran that have nothing to do with their nuclear program and everything to do with their support for terrorism and their ballistic missile program. We're going to propose giving Iran billions and billions of dollars on the front end, even though all of the so-called sunset provisions in the deal, most of them are already in the rearview mirror, and the last important one expires in 2025. And we have a new regime in Iran that's even more hardline than the previous regime, Hugh. So this is going to be an absolute disaster, and the president is going to squander whatever bipartisan goodwill he has on foreign policy related to the stiffening of the West on Ukraine and the fact that people are waking up to the fact that there are bad guys in the world, and we have to stand up to those bad guys. I cannot emphasize enough how disastrous this Iran deal will be to U.S. foreign policy and the direct connection to our feckless posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia in Ukraine. It is all connected in my mind, Hugh. I do, I do not mean to deride anyone, but I have got to be extremely critical of Wendy Sherman. Uh, I, the 2015 deal is only the second one. She also did the 1994 deal with Korea, and she is now in charge. Number two at the state. I am reminded of Tom Wolf. This is written before you were born, probably, Congressman. Tom Wolf's radical chic and Mao mao the flat catchers. It, the, the climate absolutists are the Vietnam protesters of the, of the 1960s. After they started the war, they left and opposed it. The climate absolutists don't care about anything except their positions at Aspen when the Cognoscetti gather, or, I don't know, in the MSNBC green rooms, or in Manhattan. It doesn't make a lick of sense not to, not to sanction Russian oil. What do you understand that you can tell us, and you're on Intel and Armed Services, about Russia's advance into Ukraine and what the state of public opinion is in Russia that if we pushed harder on sanctions might grow even more difficult for Putin? Well, I think what people need to brace themselves for is despite the fact that due to the, the bravery on display from the Ukrainians, and it has been very inspiring, Hugh, uh, you know, I think uh, Russian warship go uh, F yourself is a good uh, rallying cry for the West. Um, and Zelensky's leadership from the front is a good lesson for Western leaders who, you know, how to in how to deal with the crisis. Notwithstanding that, I mean, make no mistake, the Russian advance is continuing. And I don't think Putin is going to back down. He's going to go full Aleppo and Grozny on this situation. And so it's about to get much worse. And I would expect Russia to continue to take territory, albeit at a slower rate than they had anticipated, and ultimately demand that Zelensky goes, that they recognize Crimea, that they explicitly agree not to pursue NATO membership, as well as a host of other maximalist uh, 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 um, provisions uh, for any sort of off ramp diplomatically for this. So that, now, Congressman, I, I got to break in with some breaking news. Yeah. Uh, Britain has called for a complete ban of all Russian banks from SWIFT, even if it curtails Russian gas exports. Now, I'll tell you that lead from behind is back in Team Biden. They don't do anything first. We closed Russian uh, airlines off last. We do everything last. We got the stingers last. Germany beat us with the resupply. Do you think we'll follow Britain now in closing off SWIFT to Russian banks that that trade in gas exports? I, I hope so, Hugh. But uh, time and time again, this administration has turned half measures into quarter measures and invented creative reasons not to take action. The time is now. And this relates to the second part of your previous question, Hugh. I do think there is growing opposition to Putin's barbaric actions within Russia. So not only do we need to make this painful, for him, and the way you do that is going after Russia's energy sector. That is indeed the only way 
you do that. I'm all for seizing the yachts of oligarchs, but it all comes down to Russia's energy sector. You also, we also need to be in the business of harnessing that sentiment within Russia, using technology to truly capture that sentiment, AI-enabled technology, and then amplifying it, publishing it to the world, and making people understand, and making Putin himself understand what a precarious position he is in. There is still time to turn this to our advantage. Putin is going to occupy parts of Ukraine. I got that. That is a tragedy. We're going to be dealing with a humanitarian advantage. But over the long term, if a few things happen, we can look back and say that this was not a complete failure. The first and most important, in my mind, is to learn the lesson, which is that we need to arm Taiwan today, right now. There are dictators in this world that are willing to achieve their aims and take over countries by force. And the biggest one is Xi Jinping, and his biggest target is Taiwan. And you can't try and send arms to Taiwan after things start going boom. It needs to happen now, today. Lesson one. Lesson two and related, we need to invest in our own defense. We just, we're patting ourselves on the back because we passed a resolution supporting Ukraine yesterday on the House floor. Where's, where's the defense bill? Where's the defense increase? Where's the actual money for Ukraine, Q? We need hard power. Diplomacy, particularly hashtag diplomacy, and sanctions do not deter. It all stems from hard power. We need to back up our soft power with robust hard power. That may actually be the most important lesson over the long term. And the third is, you know, when you have allies on the ground that are willing to fight, like the Ukrainians have shown, we need to back those allies. We need to be in the business of building combat credible allies and convincing our NATO allies to be more lethal. And if over the long term we can harden NATO's eastern front, that's a good thing. Um, if the fact that Finland and Sweden are talking about joining NATO, this is these are all welcome developments. But at the end of the day, it comes down to robust American leadership. Our allies will follow only so far as we are willing to lead, and we are still not leading. Eloquently put, we really have, we do have enemies. They are named China, Russia, and Iran. It's the new axis, and we cannot buy their oil, their natural resources. We cannot play in their games. We cannot negotiate with their killers. Congressman Gallagher, always a pleasure. Follow him on Twitter, at Rep Gallagher. Uh, last hour, I took my relief back to .com, so I'm not taking it twice.